He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Yes. And every chain will break. Has broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Come on, church. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with God. He's fighting our battle. He's fighting our battle. Every will bow before Him. Come on, let's sing. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Put those hands together, church. We praise Your name, Lord. Yeah. To open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Yes, Lord. The God who comes to save, He's here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Sing it out! Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting the battle. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is, Our God is the Lamb.
It's not about what he's done. It's simply about who he is. He is the victorious one. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am. There's no one like you, Jesus. Can you guys just say that? There's no one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you, Lord. Lord, this is why we've come here to worship who you are. You deserve all of our worship. Church, can you sing this with us? Sing. I want to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one, sing hallelujah.
one who is to come. The Apostle Paul admonished us. He, he had gone through a great bit. And he had seen the hand of God deliver him again and again and again. And in the word of God, he, he tells us that we should not be anxious for anything. But in all things that we should make our supplications be known. That we should lift our prayers up to him. He says with thanksgiving. And that when we do so that the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our mind in Christ. Many of you are doing exactly that. You're laying it down at the foot of the cross. Weekly, you're putting your petitions before the Lord. We're praying over them seven days a week. We are forever in front of God, asking on behalf, joining our faith with yours to believe. And I, I trust in God and His Word. And more than ever before, I sense the presence of the Lord in this house. And He wants you to know that the answer to your prayer, it's here. It is here. In Mark 11, Jesus said, have faith in God. And when you, He said, when you speak to that mountain and you command it to be cast, if you believe, then it shall be done for you. So I want you to pray right now for the next minute like it's already been done. I want you to ask the Lord and receive His blessing over your life. Healing is here in the house. Deliverance is here right now in this place for you. The King of Kings is here. Yes, call out to Him. Dear God, we need you. We draw nigh to you, God. Help us, Lord. Help our faith. God, help us to pull it down from the heavenlies into this into this earthly realm, God. Help us to walk in faith, God. Help us not to doubt, Lord Jesus. Help us to walk in spite of what we see and hear, God. Right now, Lord, we're believing that, God, as we link our faith with yours, Father God in heaven, that, Lord, you are releasing and that you are answering, that it is done, and we're believing it, and we shall not doubt in Jesus' name. And if you agree, say amen. This is why we say, the mountains shake before him, the demons run and flee. At the mention of the name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell for any who can stand. Before the power and the presence of the so the mountains shake, the mountains shake before the demons run. The demons troubled minds, Lord God, we serve the God of peace. Lord God, when we have sickness in our body, we serve the God who's our healer. Lord God, when we see that there it looks to be no way, we serve a God who's our deliverer. When they falsely accuse us, Lord God, we serve a sweet vindicator. Lord God, when we stand before judgment and indictment against us, we serve the great advocate. Lord God, there is nothing that you are not greater than. And so all over this place, we acknowledge the great I am. We acknowledge the one who is, who was, and who is yet to be. Lord God, we serve the holy of holies, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. You are the great I am. And if you believe that, church, can somebody say amen? Amen. Give God praise. Amen. And amen. Aren't you glad you serve the great and holy I am? Amen, amen. You may be seated.
continue with the service. Good morning, CLC. If you don't know, I'm Pastor Nadine. And I'm Pastor Christian. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see everybody here this morning. I'm going to ask everybody right now, if you could, grab the connection card that is found inside the bulletins you got on the way in. If you didn't get a bulletin, you can kindly raise your hand right now. The ushers will come up and probably give you one so you can get a connection card. I need every single person to do this. You'll also find a connection card in the rack in front of you. Um, grab that right now. And if you are a regular attender or a member, I'm going to need you to take that connection card and fill out your name to let us know that you're here today. Give us your first and last name. Also, if you have any changes of your contact information, your address, your phone number, your email address, please put that information in there as well so we have the best way to contact you. And then once you're done doing that, regular attenders and members, please pass along the row right now if you can. Now, I got to ask, there's some very special people that are here with us today. If you are here for the very first time, would you raise your hand high enough and long enough? We want to honor you here today. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Yes. Thank awesome. you so much. Welcome. Now, we want to let you know, listen, as a first-time guest, as an honored guest here at Christian Life Center, we have a free gift we would love to be able to give you. Now, in order to receive that free gift, I'm going to ask you to take that same connection card that I was just talking about, and I need you to fill it out completely with your information, as much as you can. And then what you're going to do, you're going to hold on to that card until the end of the service, and you're going to go through the double doors. You're going to make a right, and on the west side of our lobby space is a big open space there called the Connection Center. There are going to be some leaders and some volunteers there that want to welcome you and thank you for coming. And in exchange for the card that you're filling out right now, they'll give you that free gift that I talked about earlier. Also, they just want to meet you and greet you and maybe answer any different questions you might have about our church. So once again, thank you so much for being here today. We want to let you know, listen, if you are here, we believe that you are here on purpose. And if you are looking for a home church, we want to proudly say to you today, welcome home. Amen. We believe that you're here on purpose. So we have ministry for you and for your entire family on Sundays and on Wednesday nights. That's right, Pastor Christian. I have a few quick announcements. We're going to go through this fairly quickly. Really and truly, we have a Mother's Day coming up, right? And we have to honor our mothers. Listen, we, more, we need more than a day, ladies. Hello? Hallelujah. We need, that's right. <laughs> we need more than a day, but we want to celebrate you. In your, in your bulletin, on your way in the bulletin that you received, in your bulletin, there's a Ladies Awaken Brunch Flyer. Listen, men, make your way over to that bulletin as well of, as ladies. Because, men, we want you to br br purchase a ticket for your wives, your mother, your favorite auntie, your grandmother. This is going to be a great lunch. And we have a special guest, Kim Owens, who's a phenomenal just yes. preacher of the word of God. And so we want to make sure you're part of that. Ladies in the house, come with your sisters, your daughters, and so forth, your, your co-workers as well. So if you want to get a ticket for that today, actually on your way out into the lobby, there's a women's kiosk. You can get your ticket there, but also online at clcftl.org uh, forward slash Awaken Brunch. You can purchase your ticket there as well. Make sure you do that before our tickets run out. This is a regional event, so all of our campuses will be attending. So you want to make sure to get your ticket today. That would be a great gift for someone yes, that will. you really care about. Yes, it will. Well, my husband at yeah, Ben's me a take notes. <laughs> um, also, we have another announcement. It's kind of a sad announcement because this is a longtime member that's been a part of our church. His name is Gene Myers, and he went away to be with the Lord recently. And um, they've been, him and his wife, Marilyn, have been longtime members of our church and live right behind here. They've been involved in the choir and in serving in our church. And we, we, we are grieving with the family because, yes, he's no longer with us, but we can rejoice because we know where he is. Amen. We can see him again one day. This is not goodbye. This is see you later. And I, I, I would encourage you, listen, in this time, in this season, pray for Marilyn. Pray for the family. That it is a time for them to grieve. But let's also celebrate together that Gene is no longer uh, uh, feeling any type of pain. He's not hurting anymore. But now he is together with Jesus in heaven. And we're celebrating that today. today. And uh, we want to make sure you guys are part of the memorial service that's happening next month in May. May 19th. May 19th. Uh, 11 a.m. in the chapel. We want to make sure that you're a part of that to help celebrate with the family, but also remember all the great memories that we had with Gene. And, uh, and let's continue to pray for that family. Amen? Amen. And, you know, this is a time when, when death happened in our family. This is a time it shows us how frail we really are, our humanity in all of it. But it also lets encourage us that while we're still living, we need to demonstrate love. We need to show love to our families. We need to make those phone calls. I know life is busy, but you want to make those phone calls more than a text. Make those phone calls and let people that are dear to you know that how much you love them. Amen? 
Amen. This is the time in the service church where everyone, let's just show some love. Everyone stand up across this building. Let's show some love to one another, the brothers and sisters in the faith. Hug on some necks, introduce yourself, and enjoy the rest of the service. You got 90 seconds. Make sure you make it full. not an accident I don't serve a God of accidents I serve a God of purpose the Bible says that you have been called according to his purpose you know the devil wants you to believe that somehow your life is insignificant that somehow you're here just to exist but you see, today, I want you to get in your heart. You're not here by accident. You're here by assignment. That we have a destiny in Christ. You see, the church is not here just to sing songs and have a good time. We're here to be a possessing church, a fighting church, a contending church, a church that is pressing toward the prize. Amen. Can we hear an amen in the house? In two weeks, on a Sunday night, we are going to be having a healing night. Nathan Morris is going to be with us, and God is using him in a powerful way. I was in Singapore uh, just uh, about a month ago, and I was with the Malaysia General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God. And we were talking about different ones that we've had, and he says, have you had Nathan Morris? And I said, oh, we've had him. And he says, I've had him three or three times. He said, the last time Nathan Morris came to us, now this is in Malaysia. He said, we had to rent the stadium. He said, we had a four-night crusade. We had 15,000. Now, this is a Muslim nation. And he said, we had 15,000 every night. He said, the miracles, the move of God was powerful. And you know, when he said that, I was convicted. Here we've got a speaker that's traveling around the world filling stadiums. In fact, we almost had to cancel because the president of Panama was inviting him to come. And he said, Pastor Tom, it's on the same day. I have to go to Panama. And then about a week later, they wrote back and said they rearranged our schedule. We're going to go at another time. We can still come on the 29th. And I've got to tell you, something fell in my spirit that said, this is an opportunity for South Florida to experience the power of God in a genuine and in an authentic way. And so on the 29th, he's going to be coming. We're upping our PR. We're going on the radio. We're putting out flyers, advertisement. There was just something that hit my spirit that said he shouldn't be filling stadiums around the world. And in America, it's just us that come and experience it. 
And so I want you to begin to invite. You're going to be getting flyers, I think, next week in your bulletin. We're going to begin inviting. We're going to hit radio. We're going to be putting out the word. And I've just seen in the spirit that this place is going to be full. I've just seen in the spirit it's going to be full. I don't know what that looks like, but we're going to receive that night, I believe, a powerful, powerful word. And that God's going to move. Healings are going to be released. That somebody, individuals are going to receive breakthrough. That's two weeks. Two weeks from today. Are you ready for that? I hope so. I hope so. Well, our ushers are going to come and we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings. Because of your faithfulness, we're able to be a lighthouse like this. Because of your faithfulness, we're able to have opportunities where people can experience not only you, not only your family, but a community that needs to hear the message of hope. We have a mandate to take that message everywhere to everyone. Everywhere we go, to everyone we meet. That is our mandate. We know the gospel is free, but taking it isn't. And that's where God says, I want my people who are called by my name I want them to show me that they love me by their life. And one of the ways that we show God that we love him is through the tithe, through being a kingdom builder that sends missionaries around the world. That's why we receive an offering every week. It's so that the gospel can go out. As we were singing this morning, I felt the Spirit saying, you're a warring church. I didn't, I had forgotten that video was coming. You're a contending church. You're a fighting church. We're building the kingdom of God. And that which we do is making a difference. Can I hear an amen? Eyes in our offering, as we sow our seed into the work of the kingdom, God guarantees that he'll meet every need that you have. So if you're giving today, lift your hand. Through the app, you can give online, but I want to bless you. Father, as we bring our tithe, our offering, we bring it to you. We give it, God, in faith. We give it in obedience. We give it as a part of our worship. And Father, we're asking as we give it, would you increase the impact of Christian Life Center? Would you increase the influence of our life? And God, would we be able to see in our generation... A mighty move of God like we've never seen before. Like we've heard about. Like we've seen in other places. God, we're believing for an authentic, genuine move of God right here in South Florida. And God, we ask for it. We receive it. Bless each family, each giver. Release it into their life, I pray. In your name, amen. Consider the seasons in nature. Summer is bright and sunny. Things are steady and good. 
Fall is the time of harvest. The colors, which were hidden by the green, can now be seen. During winter, it would appear that nothing is happening on the surface, but it's in the winter season that the roots are growing deep. Then spring comes and the trees begin to blossom and bloom. Everything is sprouting and new. In our lives, we will go through different seasons as well. There are ups and there are downs. Seasons come and seasons go. Every season that we go through is absolutely necessary. Whether it's a lonely winter, blooming spring, joyful summer, or harvesting fall, we must remember. God doesn't want you to just go through life. He wants you to grow through life. In every season of life, choose to thrive, not just survive. life of David. We started last week by looking at what God said about David, and that was that David was a man after God's own heart. What did that mean? We looked at that David had some characteristics, some some qualities that will help us as we go through seasons of life. Through the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the seasons of life. We're going to be looking at them from David's life and how you and I can thrive through life, not just survive. We said last week that God desires, and this is what he saw in David, God desires that we surrender completely to the Lord. We saw that David was one that served God humbly, and he lived with integrity. If we'll do those three things through all of our our seasons that we will walk through, it will be said about you and it will be said about me that we are a man, a woman after God's own heart. Today I'm going to walk you through several scriptures. I'm a little um, anxious in, uh, in, in this because... I'm going to be walking through several different passages and and chapters, and I'm going to be sharing with you the narrative of David to get to the point that we need to get to today. Now, why am I a little anxious is because most congregations and most individuals aren't used to going through as much scripture as we will go through today. But I've been told, I know, I've been here, you're an intelligent group. You can keep up with me. Is that true? Look to your neighbor and size them up and say, is that true? Uh Uh-oh, I've got some heads going, Uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh, we're in trouble. Well, today, the reason I say that is because we're going to walk through the narrative of David's life. It's very important. I don't want you to lose me because I want you to understand as we do a study of David's life. Now, just because I may tell you a few things today, it may not mean that we're going to not study that passage deeper later in our study. But if you will, take your outline or open up your CLC app. I want you to be prepared to take notes. It'll be a few minutes before we get to actually taking some notes because I want to set the stage. I want to set the background for you. Now, as you're opening your Bibles, you're going to need to turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, we're going to be starting around chapter 16 is where we're going to be starting. So take your uh, Bibles, click in your devices. I want you to, to be ready to receive the word of the Lord. So Father, as we open your word today, we know your word is anointed. Every story in your word is a story that gives us lessons and principles and helps us to be the man of God and the woman of God that you have called us to be. So use your word today to speak life into each and every one of us. In your name we pray, amen and amen. 1 Samuel 16 is where we begin our study. In 1 Samuel 16, we have the story of God sending Samuel. Samuel goes to anoint a new king. He goes to anoint a new king because King Saul, who is the current king, has disobeyed the Lord. He has not followed God and he has not done what God has desired. And God says it's time to choose a new king. Now, it will be many years before David actually becomes the king, which is a lesson in and of itself. God may give you a vision 
He may have a call on your life. There may be something that he's leading you to, but it may be many years of preparation before you get there. But I want you to know that even though maybe man forgets because David was forgotten. David's father, Jesse, brings in all of his sons as Samuel is going to anoint the new king. He's been sent to the house of Jesse. All of the boys are lined up. Samuel thinks that that the oldest is going to be the one. He was the warrior. He was strong. He was a battle. Uh, He was, you know, he's a courageous man in battle. And God said, he's not the one. Went to the second son. God said, he's not the one. One by one by one, he goes down the line. Samuel is a little confused. In 1 Samuel 16, 11, he says, are these all of the children? Samuel's thinking, have I missed God? What's going on? What is it, Lord? And David, and Samuel says, uh, Jesse says, oh yeah, there's David who's out in the fields tending the sheep. Let me tell you, when man forgets, God remembers. When man forgets, God remembers. Someone needs to post that because God's not forgotten where you're at. God remembers, God knows, and God's going to do it. And so we see in Samuel 16, Samuel uh, says, are these all of the children? And no, there is David out in the fields. David comes in, he gets anointed as king. And then right away in the next verses, verse 14, it says that the spirit of the Lord departed from Samuel and an evil spirit would begin to torment him and oppress him. In fact, in verse 18, I think I have it in your outline. 1 Samuel 16, verse 18. Verse 18 says this. Do I have verse 18? One of them said, he knew a young fellow in Bethlehem, the son of a man named Jesse, who was not only a talented harp player, but was handsome, brave, and strong, and had good, solid judgment. What more, he added, the Lord is with him. This is uh, King Saul's attendant. And he was saying, there's this young man named David. Now, we're getting introduced to David. And David is about to get introduced to Saul. David is going to come because this evil spirit would torment This evil spirit would come upon and oppress King Saul. And he would be so tormented that even his attendant knew we need to do something. And so there's David. He's out in the fields. He's strong. He plays the harp. God is with him. Favor is with him. Wouldn't it be great to hear that said about you? That others would say, I know a woman. I know a man. I know someone that can meet your need. And that's exactly what happens in this story. So David would come. He would bring peace. He would bring comfort in this time of spiritual oppression on King Saul at this time. And, and so the, 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 the story is going to begin to unfold for us. Now, I want to tell you for a moment. I don't want to pass this up. You see, David's out in the fields. He's tending the sheep. He would play the harp. He would be out there worshiping the Lord. We know from other scriptures. He doesn't think anybody knows about him. But what I want to remind you is that you can't discount anything in your past. Anything that you've done, anything that you're doing. When you're faithful to God, God sees your faithfulness. And where man may not see it, where man may not know, someone say an amen in the house. When man may not see it, God sees it and God knows. And in those incredible moments of your life, God will begin to orchestrate. He'll use things that you've done in the past. He'll use your experiences. He'll, he'll use education and relationships and things that you never thought would, would be used by him in the future becomes opportunities. And you'll look back and you'll go, that is incredible to see how God has put everything together like a puzzle in your life. Pastor Candy and I know when we came here as pastors, that was exactly what had happened. If I had time to walk you through it, it was every piece of our life was a puzzle. And at that moment where we felt the call of God to come to Christian Life Center, it was like God was saying, everything I've taken you through, everything that you've done has brought you to this moment of life in ministry that I have for you. See, when you're faithful in the field, David was out playing the harp in the field. When you're loyal in the fields, you see, it's out in the fields you can be disloyal. It's out in the fields you can goof around and do what you want. But when you're faithful in the fields, God will see it and God will promote you. 
When your boss isn't at work and you're faithful on the job, God will see it. Some of you are wondering, why haven't I gotten a promotion? You haven't been faithful in the field. you got to get faithful in the field. You need to repent and say, God, I'm going to be the best employee at that work site. I know you don't like this kind of preaching, but I'm telling you, it brings promotion later in your life. What you do now prepares you for later. David would come. He would, be, uh, uh, he would be playing the harp when the spirit would oppress King Saul. And Saul, the Bible says, fell in love with David. Saul, for 1 Samuel 16, 11 says David would come to Saul. He would attend to him. And it said Saul loved him greatly. And he became, David became Saul's armor bearer. I wonder who you're an armor bearer to. I wonder who you're watching after. I wonder who you're there. You're making sure that peace and favor follows in their life. Well, Saul loved David. Why? It's because he would play the harp. Verse 23 says he would play it. And when he would play it, Saul would be refreshed when this spirit was attacking him. Oppression, oppression would come on him. He would feel uh, refreshed and well, verse 23 says, and the evil spirit would depart from him. And so we see David getting connected with King Saul. Now, David did not stay permanently in the house of King Saul. He would go back and still tend the sheep for his father. Now that shows his faithfulness. Here, he's already in the palace. He's been anointed to be the king. He would be thinking, Dad, I've got higher places to go. Dad, there's some other things I've got to do. But he would still go back and tend the sheep out in the fields. And then that spirit would come back and they would call for David and David would come back again. It's only about five or six miles from where David is to where King Saul would have been. So it doesn't seem like in the story it's a long distance. It's not a long distance. And he would go back and forth tending the sheep and also being there to minister to King Saul. Well, in chapter 17, we pick up the next story. And in the next story in chapter 17 is the story of of Goliath. I'm not going to take time to talk about Goliath, but David's father sends David to the battlefield. Now they're not around Jerusalem now. Now they're out in battle about 45 miles or so from Jerusalem. They didn't have cars and things like that. So David would have went out to the battle. And when he went out to the battle, he comes up and we have this whole story of Goliath. We may come back to that story in the weeks to come. Many of you know that story. And as he comes, he is, he, David that is, David is uh, a little bit annoyed that nobody's going to fight this giant. That this giant is not only mocking the children of God, but this giant is now tormenting them. In fact, if you've ever been there, there's a, there's a big valley and there's a mountain range and a mountain range. The story tells us that the Philistines were on one side and the, Isra- uh, the Israelite army was on the other side. And there's big valley in the, in the middle. There's actually a stream there. We've been there. I've been there. I got five stones from it. And, and that's where David gets his five stones. And the story says that the giant would come down to the stream and he would torment them. But then... As you read it a little bit further, it says that the giant would start climbing up the hill, getting closer and closer to the, to the Israelites. And you know, there's a little lesson here is when you let the giant in your land, he's going to keep pressing and he's going to keep pushing and he's going to take more territory and he's going to go further and further if you don't stand up against the giant that's coming into your life. Well, this is what happens in our story. Well, David goes out. He conquers it. He slays the giant, cuts his head off. You know, we got that whole great children's story. You know, you think video games are bad today. Read the Old Testament. I mean, it can get graphic if they would make some video games about it. Well, 1 Samuel 18. Now, it brings us into a story that I'm not going to take time today to talk about much. But we get the story of David and Jonathan in 1 Samuel 18. David and Jonathan, and they had this bond between them. In fact, it says that Jonathan loved David, and he said that that he wanted to be, in a sense, a blood brother, King Saul's son. That means he is the prince. 
The prince is Jonathan. He would be the rightful heir to the throne. And yet David, Jonathan and Saul, we don't know, even knows that David's been anointed to be the next king. But Jonathan, in verses 1 to 4, 1 Samuel 18, Jonathan takes his robe, his prince robe, his his, his kingly robe that he would have as a part of the, the, the family of the king. He took his sword, he took his bow, and he took his belt, and he gave all of that to David. When you look at the story of David and Jonathan, you see a story of sacrifice, a story of loyalty. You see a, a story of constant encouragement. And that's what genuine relationships are all about. What's interesting to me is Jonathan was going to be the prince. He had position, he had possessions, he had the prestigeness of being in the palace, the son of the king, and yet Jonathan pursues the relationship. In fact, Jonathan in the beginning of the story was the one that pursued it, he was the one that went after it, and when you look at it, you see what is so genuine about intimate friendships and relationships. I want to encourage you, don't break a relationship. You see, Jonathan gave much more to that relationship than David ever gave. Jonathan gave more to the relationship than David ever gave. Sometimes we break relationships because we feel like it's not equal. They're not given what I'm given, and we break the relationship. Don't break a relationship that God has bonded. I want you to know that David ends up loving Jonathan greatly at the end, takes care of his family and his lineage, but it was Jonathan that pursued that relationship. Be careful. When God brings a friend in a relationship in your life that you don't let it break. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Now look with me to 1 Samuel chapter 18. We're about to get to where I want us to go today as I set our narrative. 1 Samuel 18 verse 4 is where I want us to read. 1 Samuel 18 verse 4. I don't have it on the screen so you will need to turn in your scriptures with me. We've just told you about the first few verses of chapter 18. Verse 4 picks up like this. I'm reading from the Living Bible. King Saul now kept David with him. So David's not traveling back and forth to the fields anymore, and he would not let him return home anymore. He was Saul's special assistant, and he always carried out his assignments, what? Successfully. Always carried them out successfully so Saul made him commander of his troops an appointment that was applauded by the army and the general public alike but something had happened when the victorious Israeli Israeli army was returning home after David had killed Goliath women came out from all the towns along the way to celebrate and to cheer for King Saul and they were singing and dancing for joy with tambourines and cymbals so we see that David was well liked the reason he's well liked is he was wise he was teachable he was skillful he was prosperous he was well liked the problem though is that David's popularity, as it began to grow, he gets placed as a commander of the army. And in the next few chapters, he's winning battles for Israel. And as he's winning battles for Israel, his... His, his reputation and, 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 uh, and the favor among the people was growing and growing that Saul, remember, he's got an oppressive spirit. Remember, the spirit of God has left him. Now he's leading in his human ability And in that, jealousy and anger and rage comes into his life. And when that happened, can I tell you, David is about to enter into a winter season. Today we're going to talk about winter seasons. I've titled the message, Seasons of Loneliness. Why is winter seasons are lonely seasons? Now, we live down in South Florida. We have two seasons Some places around the world have four seasons. Up north, they have four seasons. We have two seasons, hot and hotter. (laughs) And I love having two seasons. Anybody else? I love two seasons, hot and hotter. I love it. But 
We know that there are seasons. And a winter season is a cold season. It's a freezing season. It's a season of snow and ice and long nights. In Europe, they were long nights. It would get dark at 4 p.m. And it wouldn't get, you know, light again in the morning till about 6.30 a.m. Long nights. Winter is often likened to difficulty. Life is harder in the winter. You go through difficult time. There's common emotions that you have in winter seasons. You, you, can, you can feel anger. You can, you can feel disappointed. You feel lonely, rejected, sometimes hurt. But that loneliness is one of the most common emotions, especially during the winter seasons. We can get a very negative attitude. Winter seasons come... They last. We don't know how long they'll be. And in life, we have learned that there are winter seasons. There are seasons where we feel uh, rejected. There are seasons where we, we, we feel hurt. We feel angry. We feel disappointed. We feel lonely. Life is about seasons. And winter seasons is one of the hardest seasons. Now, for those of you that are married, let me talk to you just for a moment in this message. For those of you that are married, winter seasons for marriage are often characterized by coldness, hardness, and bitterness. Dreams that you had once now are covered over with ice. It's slippery at this stage in your marriage. Things aren't going good. Many times you're living in the same house, but you're living independently. You live in the same house, under the same roof, but things are rigid. There's an unwillingness to change. There is this, this sense of, I, I don't care what the other person thinks anymore. There's not a, 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 a cooperation in the marriage. You begin to live independently. And these emotions in the winter season of your marriage many times turns to hurt, Anger, disappointment, loneliness, and a sense of rejection. Marriages go through winter seasons. Some of you are in a winter season. And unfortunately, many marriages end in divorce in winter seasons. They don't know how to go through the winter season to get to a new spring season. Winter is a season, but you got to get through the season if you're going to get to that which God has. If you're married, you've got to be careful of your attitude in the winter season. Your attitude about your spouse. This, this, this passive feeling that I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to let it be the way it is. It's never going to get better. Winter seasons mean we feel it, it, you know, it's worse. Nothing's going to change. We begin to think the problems are too big. We can't get out of it. We get discouraged. We get hopeless. We begin to let our mind wander. We begin then in our loneliness to result to other things that then will have consequences that will accelerate the breakup in that marriage if you're not careful to recognize the winter season. And again, many marriages, and let me tell you, Christians are not immune to this. Many marriages go through a winter season. If you're not in one now, I can guarantee you probably have said, I've been in one, or I let you know you will come to one. Because just like in life, there are seasons. In marriage, there are seasons. And can I tell you, I've only been married 28 years, but can I tell you, there's been many winter seasons. It's not just one winter season, make, th make it through it, and it's over. Thank God it's behind me. There are many winter seasons, and you've got to learn how to push through the winter seasons. Now, if you're married in the weeks to come, we're going to keep having little tidbits that will help you to know how to come out of winter season and move to the next season of what God has for you. The thing about a season, especially a winter season, is people don't go, down, go outside, lay down in the snow and wait to die. They may go out there and play around in the snow, but they get back up. They know something is wrong. I need shoes. I need clothes. I'm not supposed to live out here in the winter. And neither is your marriage supposed to be living in a winter season. You've got to push through that winter season. The trials that are there, the Bible says, will produce patience in you. 
if you let it. It will produce perseverance in you if you let it. And it will bring forgiveness, which will bring a greater sense of love in your marriage. So in your, if you're in a winter season in your marriage, I want to tell you, it's a season. Don't abandon it. Don't lay down in the snow. Don't just sit there and say, it's not going to change. I'm going to lay down and die. No, spring is around the corner and spring is a good season. Now back to our story. That was a little tidbit for those that are married. 1 Samuel 18 is where we pick up. Now because of David's popularity, Saul becomes afraid. Verse 10, 11, and 12 says that Saul becomes afraid of David. And it's one it's, it, and oftentimes, it's, it's those that, 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 that uh, let, me, let me rephrase it. Often, the ones that are out to get us are out to get us because they're afraid of us. So if someone's attacking and criticizing and coming at you, there is something that is, a, is making them afraid or intimidated or insecure around you. For David, it was because he was prospering. The Lord was with him. And whatever he did, God was blessing him. Now, David is about to enter into a winter season. His winter season is going to be a season of loneliness. And I'm about to show it to you and show you then what the causes are and how do you get out of it. But David had not done anything wrong. Hear me today. God was with them. He was faithful. And he had been faithful to God. He had modeled humility, dependability, and integrity. He had not done anything wrong. And yet, right now, doing everything right, everything began to fall apart. And he enters into his winter season. Let me ask you, have you ever been there? Doing everything right, and it seems like everything is falling apart. Talk to someone this week, said, I've lost my job. I didn't do anything wrong. It was, a, it, was, it was what was happening in the work side. I didn't do anything wrong. Pastor, all of a sudden, my marriage, we began to drift apart. My health, something came. I went for a normal doctor's appointment. And all of a sudden, I was told I had cancer. And I was like, you've got to be mistaken. What are you talking about? There's no way. And all of a sudden, in those winter seasons... We have a tendency to pull back and just try to survive through it and just try to make it and live. But what I wanted you to know today is that winter is a season and you can thrive through it. You can push through it. Doesn't mean the elements of the season may change, but you got to recognize the emotion. You got to recognize the attitude that you can have in the season so you know how to push through it. Well, God allows... Everything to be taken away from David. Everything that he's had, he's been faithful, which really challenges our theology, is why would God let everything be taken away when he's been faithful? But God was shaping him. And there were some characteristics that God still wanted to, to work into his life. 1 Samuel 18, look with me at verse 7. This is where it started with David. I talked about his popularity and in and, and, and the growing popularity. And it says, when David would come back, when they would come back from battle, those that were singing would say, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Of course, Saul was very angry. What's this? He said to himself, they credit David with 10,000 and me with only 1,000? Next, they'll begin making him their king. And from that time on, King, king Saul kept a jealous watch on David. Verse 10, the very next day, in fact, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul. And he began to rave like a madman. David began to soothe him with with the playing of the harp as he did whenever this happened. But Saul, who was fiddling with his spear, suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. David jumps aside and escapes. And the Bible says this happened on another time as well. And now we see David about to enter a winter season. David's on the run from Saul. 
1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2, it says that David, 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2, that David left Gath and he escaped to the cave. Underline that in your notes. To the cave of Adullam. He escapes to the cave. The cave is now going to represent his winter season. Have you ever been in a cave? Have you ever been in that moment? Can I tell you, it doesn't mean it's over. But for David, it was about to start something new. It was a new season that God was beginning to craft. Now, we know how David is feeling from another portion of Scripture. I want you to turn with me to uh, 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 Psalms 142. In Psalms 142, we get this idea of how David is feeling. In fact, many times in Scripture, when, especially in Psalms, it will tell us what is happening, the context and who is writing. And here we find Psalms 142, verse 1. It says, David says, I cry out to the Lord. I plead with the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and I tell him all of my troubles. When I was overwhelmed, you alone know the way that I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Then I pray to you, O Lord, I say, you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. Hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so I can thank you. What's his prison? It's a cave. He's in a cave. Bring me out. The godly will crowd around you. For you are good to me. uh, uh, David is in his cave. In this, you hear his despair. He's at a low point. Has lost his security. No food. No one to talk to. That promise he, he, he once had. He's not clinging on to it in a moment. Why? He's in the dark cave. And he becomes what we could call a cave dweller. I don't know about you, but there's been moments that I found myself in caves. And you've got to determine when you get into a cave, are you going to be a cave dweller? Are you going to understand what God is doing? What I love about David is he doesn't lose sight of God. Now let's talk about the cave. The cave in our life in the winter season is most characterized by loneliness. Causes of loneliness are four primary causes, especially spiritually. The first one for David is opposition. It's the cave that he's entered into because of opposition on his life. Who was opposing him? Saul, that's right, Saul. And and as Saul begins to pursue him, David loses his position. When people begin to persecute you and and oppose you and and come against you and attack you and you lose your position, it's very easy to fall into a season of loneliness. Do you remember out on the playground when, when kids would pick on other kids, how they would feel, they would feel lonely and how they would feel rejected and, and defeated. But being alone hurts you most. When you begin to understand this painful experience and you begin to think nobody understands that opposition and that pain and nobody's understanding you when you're walking seasons and loneliness. And a, a second cause, first is opposition. The second cause in David's life was rejection. Rejection. I didn't have time to study it in the story. David's wife, he was given King Saul's daughter to be his wife when he won the battle. And when he won the battle, she became his wife. And, and then when his fa- her father began to attack, King Saul began to attack David, and David escaped, she basically abandoned him. She helped him to escape, but then she abandoned him, and it was rejection that David received. He flees alone, never to be with her again, never to reunite with her. His wife rejects him. You know when it's lonely, is when family and those close to you reject you. 
when trust is broken, when those that are supposed to love you the most reject you, it's easy to withdraw to the cave. It's easy to isolate. It's easy to get alone. When you feel betrayed, when you feel forsaken, when you feel abandoned, it can happen by family. It can happen in business. It can happen on the work site. It can happen by friends. And boy, it's most painful, isn't it, when it happens by a spouse, one that you love the most. The truth is that those are times that will come, and maybe some of you right now are there, and that rejection's got you hiding in a cave, and you've pushed yourself in the cave. All I'm here to say today is that God knows what you're going through. God sees it. God cares. I'm sorry that you're feeling that, and I want you to know God has a greater plan than just living in your cave. He's got a greater plan. Rejection is one of the most devastating things. It hurts you, especially when it's those close to you. The basic emotion that God's built in all of us is acceptance. And so when people reject us, it's painful. And many times, how do we, how do we respond to that rejection as we throw ourselves into work? And we, we pour ourselves there and we become workaholics or, or maybe we, we, we begin to, to get more and more and more and, and materialism begins to be our crutch and we begin to fill the void. Maybe we turn to alcohol or prescription drugs or other types of, of drugs and, and we withdraw there. For many, maybe it's their sexual escapes. They, they go through a series of one night stand, bar hopping, pornography, and they begin to withdraw there. Many times we just become so deeply depressed that we withdraw. Loneliness is a winter season and many times it comes because of rejection. Thirdly, it's many times caused because of transition. And this is where you've got to be careful when you're transitioning through life, transitioning from one place to another. When your children go off to college or or go off on their own, be careful. Talk to them, help them, pray for them. Because in transitions, we lose sometimes something that will be very close to us. And if we're not careful in that season, we will find ourselves in a cave. What did David lose in his transition was Samuel. Samuel had anointed him. And when we look at our story, Samuel came. David told him what was going on. And Samuel sent him off. And when David went off, David at that moment lost his mentor. He lost that one that was close to him. And can I tell you, life is a series of transitions. And in any major change, it can cause loneliness. And then, before we get to how do we handle our seasons of loneliness, a fourth cause is separation. You see, in our story, David and Jonathan get to that point and and Jonathan warns David that his father is after him and Jonathan sends David off and now there's the loss of a friend. He loses his close friend. People that we care about, people that we love, many times in our loneliness we get cut off from them and we isolate from them. Maybe you've gotten isolated because of a job, travel, illness. Do you know 40 million Americans last year moved, 40 million Americans. That's over 14% of our population. And what happens is this uprootedness is an epidemic. And this epidemic is loneliness. And the price of our independence is loneliness. And social media has it where we become more and more isolated, individualistic, and lonely than we've ever been before. The result, we feel hopeless. We feel like we've lost our faith. We we feel a loss of self-respect and and we dive deep into our cave. But what I want to do is show you in our final moments how David dealt with this cave season in his life. Look with me in this next scripture that I'm going to uh, take you to here in Psalms 57. Psalms 57, we see how David copes with loneliness, how he dealt with loneliness from the book of Psalm 57. It tells us it's a psalm of David as he fled from Saul into the cave. So this is right here. And David begins to show us how to cope with our loneliness. He says, have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy. 
I look to you for protection. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. I cry out to God most high, to the God who will fulfill his purpose for me. He will send help from heaven to rescue me, disgracing those who hound me. My God will send forth his unfailing love and faithfulness. Can I hear an amen? How did David handle this season? Well, the Bible tells us that a group of men come to join David. If you'll, uh, if, uh, if you'll read the story with me in 1 Samuel 22, 1 Samuel 22, verse 1 and 2, it says, So David left Gath, I read that earlier, escaped to the cave of Dulam. Soon his brothers and all of his relatives joined him there. Then, look here, then others began coming. Others began coming to him. Men who were in trouble, men who were in debt, or those who were just discontented until David was the captain of about 400 men. When you look at David's life in these final moments now, we see how David coped with loneliness. First of all, David minimized his hurt. You see, if you rehearse your hurt over and over and over again, if you only hold on to it and you rehearse it, that hurt will turn to bitterness and that bitterness will grow. David said, God, you are my refuge. You help me in distress and sorrow. You help me when I'm going through danger. Until danger passes, I will find my refuge in you. I'll come under your wings. So what does he do is he minimizes his hurt. How does he minimize it? But by focusing on who God is. You see, resentment will only make you lonelier. If you resent your ex-husband, if you resent that one that hurt you, if you resent your employer, your boss, it drives you deeper and deeper into your cave. You build a wall around your life. No one enjoys a cynic. No one likes being around a cynic. And bitterness and loneliness is like a cycle. You become bitter and then lonely and then more bitter and then more lonely and you're diving deeper and deeper into your cave. So you got to minimize your hurt. How do you minimize it? Is you say, God, you're my refuge. God, you're my provider. I'm coming under your wings. God, no matter what dangers come in my way, I'm keeping my eyes on you. You're in the right place. You're in the right place to minimize the hurt. Secondly, you've got to recognize God's presence. David said in that passage of Psalm that I read to you a few moments ago in Psalm 57, David said, God will send help to me. God will send help and will help me. And God, I'm believing that you're going to be there right with me. Where is God when you're lonely? He's right beside you. He wants you to feel his presence. Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. In fact, look with me at another verse. Psalm 31. Turn over there. Flick over there. Psalm 31. Psalm 31. I know I'm giving you a lot of passages today, but we've got to hold this thought for a moment. Psalm 31, verse 1. In you, O Lord, in you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Can I hear an amen? Deliver me in your righteousness. Somebody that's in a cave today, this is your verse. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge. A strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for, your, for the sake of your name, lead me, guide me, free me, set me free. For you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. So in your winter, you've got to take refuge in him. You've got to recognize his presence. Feel his strength. You're wounded in spirit. David cries out to God. I'm your, 
I'm yours, Lord, and I take refuge in you. What does refuge mean? It means that you have a protective place. Refuge means there's a place of safety for you, a place of security for you. When you recognize God's presence, you're saying, God, I come under your safety, under your refuge, under your security. Loneliness is a time to become better acquainted with God. Prayer is a powerful antidote to loneliness. If you're lonely in your cave, prayer is a time where you begin to look to him, find his strength, find his encouragement, and know that he is right there with you. God is a refuge when you're walking through sin and guilt, when accusations are coming at you. God is your refuge. Say, he is my refuge. God's your refuge. When the adversary is coming at you, when people misunderstand you and assault you, assault you, God is your refuge. Recognize his presence. When you're in the cave, hear me. You have a tendency to separate from God. Separate from the house of God. You need to be here when you're in a cave more than ever. You need to be here because God's presence and God's people will pull you out of the cave. Some of you that are watching right now, you're in a cave. Get out of bed and get to the next service. Get out of the cave. God's presence will bring you out of the cave. Now it's hard in the cave. It's dark, it's wet, it's lonely, it's cold. Leave me alone, I'm going to pull the sheet over my head. That's what you want when you're in the cave. Leave me alone. But a friend won't leave you alone. Get up, get out of bed, get dressed, shave, put some perfume on. You never know what's going to happen. Get out of the cave. And thirdly, thirdly, what I love about David's story here, and I end with this. Is that I've got to emphasize others' needs. You see, if you're in a cave, it's all me. It's what I feel. It's what I'm going through. It's what I'm experiencing. But in those moments, if you can get your eyes off of you. And you can begin to look at others. And emphasize others' needs. Can I tell you, this is a huge secret to getting out of the cave is it pulls you out of the cave. So David's in his cave and his family comes. Don't abandon your friends and your family when they're in the cave. His family comes. And then it says those that were in debt begin to come. Those that had debtors that were coming at them. Those that were in trouble begin to come. Those that were just rejected and dejected begin to come. And before you know it, David is the captain of an army of four Hundred, And right there in his pain, in his loneliness, he becomes, he kind of becomes the Robin Hood of, 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 of Sherwood Forest. He becomes the, the Robin Hood of the Judean wilderness. And those that are in the caves, the mountains, the, the deep valleys, he begins to utilize his time. Those that were hurting, he takes them in and he begins to focus on them. In your season of loneliness... Focus outwardly on others. It's a secret. Begin to sow into others. Find a ministry and begin to serve in that ministry. It'll pull you out of your cave. Pull you out of your cave. It'll show you others are going through maybe even greater things. And you'll begin to see how God will use you to encourage them. You'll begin to find hope and strength. But you know what happens when you serve others? It's there is supernaturally an anointing that's released to you. And it brings you out of your cave. Is it winter? Sure, it's winter. But now you got a jacket on. Now you got shoes on. Now you're trudging through the snow and you're making it. You're shoveling it. You're getting it out of the way. And something happens to you. I don't know how, but God does it. The loneliest person is the man or the woman that only focuses on themselves. But if you'll get out of your cave and you'll begin to focus on others and you'll begin to pour into others and you'll minister to others, stop living in your cave and start being what God has called you to be, I guarantee you, you won't take on that that weight of attitude that comes in the cave. I want to pray with you. Father, right now, 
As we come to the end of this message, I pray, God, that you will bring us out of our cave, out of our loneliness, out of the winter season. And that, God, you'll bring us to a place of refuge where we know your presence is with us. Will bring us to a place of, of understanding of what you want to do through us. We may not understand this season, but we recognize today it's a season. It's a season that we're in. And today, God, I pray that you will bring those that are in their cave out of it today. With heads bowed, my challenge to you today is to open your heart to Christ. If you're in a cave and you don't know Christ, the greatest thing that you need in your life right now is the presence of the Lord. You need God's presence in your life. If you're in a cave and you don't have a relationship with God, lift your hand and say, Pastor, today I want you to pray with me. Just lift it right now in these final moments. That's right. Lift it. That's right. Just say, I'm in a cave and I know I'm not where I need to be. I need God's presence with me in my cave. Lift your hand right now. Hands are lifted. Say with me, Father God, I need you. I need you to be my refuge. And I come to you. I ask you to give me grace, mercy, show me your love. And today I come to you recognizing that I need you in my life. I need your peace. I need your protection. I need your guidance. I need hope from you. And today I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sin. Become my Savior. Become my Lord. Today I find refuge in you. In Jesus' name. Father, right now for those that prayed that prayer, I pray God that the prayer will begin to enable them to sense your presence in their life. If you're in your cave, I encourage you, get connected to others. Don't be alone. David's family, others began to join him. He welcomed them into that cave and he began to lead them. Get connected to others. Don't be isolated. Don't be alone. Get in a life group. Take your connection card. Check it and say, I'm going to get in a life group. And then lastly, begin to emphasize the needs of others. What does that mean? As you begin growing, you begin serving others. And as you do, you're not just going through your season. You're growing through your season. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Stand together around as the worship team leads us. Come on, let's declare you are God alone. Sing you are God alone. From before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. Times and bad, you are on your throne. that God is right there next to you and he wants you to come out of your cave can somebody give God praise this morning listen we want to remind you that you're here for the first time listen make sure you go by the connection center we have a free gift we would love to meet you and greet you and before we leave here today we a customary thing that we do all the time is we say our closing prayer here together and we want to make sure that we remind ourselves of who we are and what we're about amen so let's say it real loud and proud together say father Help us to be the people and the church you have called us to be. A people that always build up and never tear down. That always encourage and never discourage. A people and a church that take a message of hope everywhere we go to everyone we meet. And we say in Jesus' name real loud. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Oh,
Unstoppable, unstoppable, unstoppable. That's who you are. That's who you are. 